Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, again, we're just going to go ahead and wrap this uh, book up tonight. And uh, it's been a great book. You know, First and 2 Timothy are great books to go through, a lot of doctrine in there, a lot of important things that we can learn from the Word of God. And one of the things we see right away in this chapter is, of course, the manner of preaching that a preacher should have. He says there in verse 1, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort all, uh, with all long suffering and doctrine. So we see right away that there is a certain type of preaching that a preacher, a man of God, should have. That's what Paul's doing here. He's admonishing Timothy to preach in a specific manner. And of course, he starts out there in verse 2 by saying, preach the word. You know, and a lot of preachers today would do very well to just start right there. You know, instead of getting up and telling stories after story after story or just trying to win you over with some emotional sentiment, they should just get up and preach the word Amen. and let the Bible do its work in the hearts of, uh, of God's children. And, uh, you know, that's a real good place for people to start. And it's one that any preacher has to keep in mind if they're going to be a preacher is that that's what they need to be preaching is preaching the Bible. And, uh, you know, what the great thing about that is, is that you got a lot of material to preach about when you preach about the Bible. And, uh, you know, people can, can appreciate a sermon and, or, or really like a sermon. But at the end of the day, anything that's made a sermon great is the Word of God. It's not necessarily the man behind the pulpit, but it's the fact that we're preaching a book that is powerful, that is sharper than any two-edged sword, that is, you know, dividing us under the soul and spirit and the joints of marrow and is a thought, uh, discerning the thoughts and tents of the heart. So that's a really good admonition right there for anyone who desires to preach, is to make sure that when we're getting up and preaching, we're preaching the Bible. And, you know, there's a lot we could say about that. Uh, people need to focus on preaching what they know, you know, what we know about the Word of God, not get so caught up about what we don't know, but not preaching the things that we understand. He says to preach the Word, you know, and that should tell us, I mean, to have the fact that he would have to admonish the preacher to preach the Word, you would think it would just go without saying that if you came to a church, that's what you were going to hear. But here we see Paul admonishing Timothy, hey, you need to preach the Word, you need to preach the Bible, which tells us that there's a temptation to not preach the Bible, or maybe to hold something back, you know, or to say, well, I'm not going to preach this part of the Bible, or this might offend somebody, or this might cause somebody to leave, or this might push people away if I preach this. But, you know, the Bible says we need to preach the whole thing. That's so why it goes on and says there be instant in season, out of season. You know, it, uh, preaching should not pander to a culture. You know, we always want to hear a lot of that in the, in the, in the new, uh, these, you know, these non-denom churches and things like that. They're always talking about the culture, the culture. What kind of culture are we going to have here? What's our culture like? How are we going to reach people in the culture? You know, I'm not interested in reaching the culture. I'm not interested in reaching souls with the power of God, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to try and pander to their culture. I'm going to be instant, you know, in preaching the word in season and out of season. What does that mean? Well, think about when the fruit is in season, right? There are certain times of the year that you're going to eat certain fruits and certain times of the year you're not going to eat certain fruits because they're either in season or out of season. And he's saying here, look, there is no season to the Word of God. It's in season and out of season. When people want it, when people don't want it, go ahead and preach it. When it's popular, when it's unpopular, go ahead and preach it because that's what needs to be preached, whether it's popular or not. And he goes on and says, and you can kind of get a sense of why this type of preaching that Paul wants to be done is unpopular. Because he goes on and he says there to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So he says one of the first things you got to do is reprove. You know, and this is two negatives before you get to a positive, right? Reprove and rebuke. And a lot of times you kind of think, well, that means the same thing, but it actually means two. It doesn't mean exactly the same thing. It's both, you know, both are telling people that they're wrong about something, right? And he's saying reprove. You know, a preacher should be able to get up and tell people that they're wrong. Now I'm saying he has to specifically get up and, you know, single people out and say, hey, you're wrong. But if, here's the thing. If you preach the whole word of God, it's going to naturally tell people where they're wrong. Because we're all sinners. None of us is perfect. And if we come to church where there's sound biblical preaching taking place, we're gonna, and we read the word of God, we're going to come to a place where we go, whoa, I'm wrong about this in my life. You know, this needs to change in my life. So that's why we need to be instant, in season, out of season as preachers and preach the whole counsel of God so that it can do its work of reproving people and telling them where they're wrong so that they can get it right. You know, we're all wrong about something, you know, from time to time. No one here is perfect. We're all going to be wrong about something. And what the preaching of the Word of God does is it brings it to light and shows us where we're wrong and gives us an opportunity to get it right. He goes on and says, reprove, and then he says, rebuke, which is a stronger form, right? If you, if you look at it this way, you know, reproving would just be to tell somebody that they're wrong. You know, that can be done gently. 
You know, and it could be, it could be even tell somebody something that they're wrong about where if they don't get it right, you know, it's not good, but it's not, it's not a, like a, you know, a deal breaker. Hey, you need to work on this. Hey, this is something that's wrong. You should work on this. Whereas rebuke is like, you're, you're wrong and you need to get it right. Like that, you know, being wrong is not an option, right? We should never want to be wrong, but it's a stronger form of reproving somebody, Rebru rebuking them, telling them, hey, you need to get this right. Not just you're wrong, but you're wrong and you need to get it right. Because here's the thing, people, you know, they get into sin. People get into heresy and they need to be uh, dealt with immediately. That's a rebuke where things have to be corrected right now. So that's a stronger form of telling somebody that they're wrong. It has a more, you know, stronger connotation, the fact that there might be more severe consequences if they resist that, you know, <coughs> and that's a whole other sermon there. Of course, then we get to the positive part where he says to exhort, you know, and exhort is kind of to, to uh, encourage people. So if you have reprove where you're telling people, hey, they're wrong, you have rebuke where you're telling them to get right, exhorting people would be telling them, you know, encouraging them to do the right thing or to continue doing the right thing or and trying to get them to go in the right direction. So exhorting is just more of an encouraging. And, you know, and we want all of this as preachers. And if we're in a church, this is the kind of church we want to be in where we're going to hear all of this. Now we're only going to hear rebuke. You know, if we're always hearing rebuke, then maybe we need to you know, search our own hearts. It might be a problem. But you know, if it's always just reproof, yeah, you're wrong this, you're wrong this, you're wrong this, you know, you, and just, it's just always you're coming down and the preachers is always coming down on you. You know, we don't want to be that kind of a preacher. But then again, they go to the other extreme too, don't they? Which is much more popular. Whereas every sermon is exhorting. Every sermon is, is, is uh, encouraging. You know, every sermon is just some emotional, heart-wrenching, you know, moving sentiment that's trying to get you to aspire to greater heights in Christ. And I'm all for those sermons. But they can't make up the whole of a ministry. They can't be what we're... Uh, are, you know, what we're based in as, as, as preachers. So he says to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, and then he says this, with all long suffering. And it's interesting that he tells that to a preacher because here's the thing, preachers are going to have to repeat themselves. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, I've heard, been, been heard something in a sermon and been reminded of the fact that I've been heard that before. But I didn't remember that I'd heard that before until I heard it again, right? Do you, you see what I'm saying? We forget Right? We forget these things. That's why Paul, as we've talked about before, was always saying, you know, putting you in remembrance, though you already knew this, putting in remembrance, it was needful to, to write unto you uh, the same things, you know, that we should not let these things slip. And that's what Paul is kind of saying here. We need to be long-suffering as preachers because people need to be reminded of the same things from time to time, over and over. And, you know, people, you know, sometimes it takes people to really absorb things and, and get things right. So, you know, people don't always get it the first time around. So be long-suffering, he's saying. You know, don't be afraid to put up with people not getting it the first time. Continue, uh, you know, preaching these things. And then he goes on, he says, with all long-suffering and what? And doctrine. And boy, is that one that's lacking today. Right. You know, that's one thing that we just need to have, could not get enough of. If there's any one thing that's lacking in churches today, it's this. It's sound doctrine being preached from the pulpit where they're getting up instead of just trying to move you to tears with some story, you know, th they should be preaching doctrine, right. teaching their people sound doctrine. And often they can't do that because they themselves do not know sound doctrine, so they can't teach it. But we need to be preaching in this manner, reproving, rebuking, exhorting, with all long-suffering and doctrine, with doctrine because of the fact that the meat of the Word of God is what's going to make a mature believer. That's what's going to make you strong in Christ and be able to not be swept away with every wind of doctrine and carried about with, with, with uh, you know, every wind of doctrine and slight of men and cunning craftiness wherein they lie in wait to deceive. That we ought to be built up in doctrine and have sound doctrine and knowledge of the things that we believe. That's why that has to be taught. You know? So that's what we, this is the type of preaching that he wants. And then he goes on in verse 3 and he gives them the reason why he ought to preach in this manner. Why is it that he wants Timothy to be in season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine? Because he says in verse 3, For the time will come when they shall, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now I believe, of course, this applies to Timothy's day. This is probably something that you could even say applies to a lifespan of a church. There's going to be come a time when all this preaching is taking forth and there's going to be perhaps a season in a church or an individual's life 
as a preacher where they see people that are not going to want to endure their sound doctrine. They're going to run into this from time to time. And this could speak more broadly to the fact that we're going to be in the, you know, in the end times, as we saw in chapter 3, where people are going to be lovers of their own selves. They're not going to desire the things of God. And they're going to be these type of people that are not going to endure sound doctrine. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're not going to sit under it. They're not going to put up with it. They're not going to deal with it. They're going to say, wait, I want the encouraging sermon. I just want to be told everything's okay in my life. I just want to be told that God's all right with my sin and that it doesn't matter what I do. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're not going to endure the preaching that it exhorts and, and, and uh, rebukes and reproves. They're going to, and it goes on and says, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, enter the Christian bookstore. You know, go, you can walk in into the Christian bookstore and you can find a lot of teachers that'll just, just, you know, give you a little scratch whenever you need it and tell you whatever you want, you know. And you can go find what Paul really meant about women, you know, and have all that explained away about how, how it's okay for the ladies to be in leadership and Paul was just a woman hater. And they'll scratch your ear about that and make you feel just fine and dandy with Joyce Meyer and everybody else. Or whatever topic you want. You know, they're okay with your, your, your you know, queer bait, you know, uncle or whatever. And make you feel all right that you, you know, you could just love the sinner and, and hate the sin. You know, there's a lot of people out there and that's what they want. They're heaping to themselves teachers today. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a market of supply and demand. Right. If there's a demand for it, someone's going to supply it. And if there's people out there that want their ears tickled, they want to be itched, they want to heap to themselves, these teachers, there's going to be plenty of false prophets that are going to come along and fill that void and say, oh, let me, let me scratch your ear and tell you whatever you want to hear. And Paul's warning us about this, saying, look, you need to preach in this manner because there's going to come a time where people are not going to endure it. <coughs> they will not endure sound doctrine. They're going to begin to believe strange, unbiblical things. You know, we talked about the Christian bookstore, but what about, hey, YouTube, right? I mean, you can heap to yourself some teachers. You can get yourself a playlist going on YouTube, and they will teach you all kinds of weird things that will just give you goosebumps and make you just, you know, bug out over some strange doctrine. You know, and you can be contemplating how tall giants really were and, you know, how they were the, you know, the Nephilim and all this other stuff, all this nonsense that's out there. Strange doctrines. Right. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to heap to themselves teachers that are going to teach them things, you know, like the flat earth and everything else that they want to hear. All these weird, strange things. <clears throat> they will not endure sound doctrine. They're not going to receive correction. You know, they're going to, it says after their own lusts, they're doing what they want. That's what they want. They want their lust satisfied in, in this area. They don't want the truth. They're not interested in sound doctrine. They're not interested in being reproved or rebuked. They just want to have their own lust satisfied in this area. They're not interested in the truth. Go ahead and keep something here in 2 Timothy. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 30. There's nothing new under the sun. This is the way it's always been. And Paul here is warning Timothy of the fact that it's going to continue to happen. That there's going to come a time when people are not going to endure sound doctrine because of their own lusts. They're going to wander away. They're going to go out of the way. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8, it says, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it might become, uh, be for the time to come forever and ever. Now, has that happened? Yep, it's called the Bible, right? This is written down about these people, this backslidden Israel in this chapter. You know, that, that was a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of right there, right? He said, note it in a book. How about the Bible? That'd be a good book that's going to last forever and ever. He said, and this is what he wrote about him in verse 9. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophesies, prophets prophesy not unto us right things. It's not that they don't want them to prophesy. It's not that they want them to shut up and sit down. And it's not that they don't want to go to church and have somebody tell them something sounding spiritual. It's just they don't want to hear the right things. They want to hear something as long as it's not the truth, as long as it's not what the Bible actually says. As long as what's preached isn't going to reprove them or rebuke them, they're fine with it. They say, prophesy unto us right things. Now notice how they rationalize this in their mind. They say, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us wrong things. Is that what they say? No, in their mind, it's smooth things. They won't call it the wrong thing. They won't come out and just say, hey, it's the wrong thing that we want. They'll say, oh, it's not the right thing. It's just smooth things. Sounds nicer than saying, just tell us lies. Just preach to me lies. 
No, they just want smooth things. And often that's what lies are. They're told very smoothly, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're smooth things that are just going to make you feel good and everything's all right and God's not angry with you and whatever lie you want to hear. You say prophesy deceits to us. They want them to just be lied to. So go ahead and turn back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter, the th ch chapter 4. And he says, uh, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They just want someone to say what they want and not what they need. They're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in hearing what they need to hear. They just want what they want to hear, their own lusts. Verse 4, it says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, who turned away their ears? They did. Yep. This is something they wanted. Right. They said they're going to turn away theirs. They're the ones that are turning their ears from the truth. It's not that the truth isn't there, that it can't be heard. It's just that they don't want to hear it. You know, and in a lot of places, you could say that about America today. I mean, if you've got access to the YouTube, you know what? The truth is on it. You could find sound preaching. You know, if you live in the city of Tucson, you could find a sound biblical church. If you live in Phoenix, you could find sound biblical preaching being taught. But is this place packed to the brim? Nope, it's not. Will it ever be just some mega church? I don't know, maybe. I'm all for it, as long as it doesn't compromise the word of God. It just goes to show you today, because there's plenty of churches out there, aren't there? And they're full, and they're big, and they're booming. You know, and they only have one service a week, maybe. Or two services that are exactly the same on Sunday morning. Or they might have the traditional and then the, and then the contemporary service. And the preacher preaches the same message. They're so big they have to break up the congregation. Is it because they're preaching the truth? No. Is it because they're getting up and exhorting and reproving and, and rebuking people for their sin and telling them to get right? And that, in fact, God is angry if you're into this or that or whatever it is, that God wants you to live a godly and holy life? Do you think that's what they're preaching at the mega church? No, they're down there scratching ears, friend. And you can go down there and spiritually get a back rub and have them just slap you on the back and say, go on about your life. Everything's fine. Don't change a thing. Continue living you know, a wicked, worldly life. God's fine. You know, you, there's nothing to worry about. Don't worry about the lost. They'll find their own way. All, this, not, all these lies. And people want that. That's why they're big. Because it's, it's supply and demand. They turn their ears from the truth. And it's not that they just want to quit listening to something. It's just they go find what they want. And they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So <laughs> they fill that void. You know, they don't just reject biblical preaching and leave it like that. They fill that void with what? With fables. With all kinds of fables. I mean, I mean, fables is kind of a broad term, right? We could talk about a lot of different things that could be marked up as fables today. And, uh, you know, maybe that'd be another sermon for another time. But go ahead and jump into verse 5 there. So he warns Timothy. He says, look, this is the manner of preaching that what I want done. You need to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. And here's why. You know, because people are going to turn their ears from the truth and be turned on the fables. They're going to have itching ears. And then he kind of gives them this encouragement. You know, because it kind of doesn't paint a very good picture. If you recall Thursday night, you know, he didn't, he didn't you know, Paul didn't lay out a, a, a bed of roses for Timothy when he was telling him what to expect in the ministry in the last days and things like that. And he says, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. <laughs> you know, the ministry is not uh, uh, supposed to be easy. It's not, you know, if you're doing it right, it's not easy. He says, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. He tells them to watch. Of course, you know, that means to be vigilant. To not let, you know, this type of... Because you know, the temptation is to start giving people what they want to hear. The temptation is to say, well, maybe if we did compromise a little bit on our music. Maybe if we did bring in the drum set and <laughs> spice things up a little bit and got some lights up here. and You know, I could get graphic tea on. You know, maybe something a little looser around the waist, admittedly, you know. I won't go so far as skinny jeans, right? But maybe just some with holes in it, you know, and I could just get a bar stool. We could get rid of this old wood pulpit, this nasty old wood pulpit. It's all beat up, right? And we could, uh, we could get a nice one of those glass ones. I'd get one of those little earpieces, <laughs> you know, and I could, I could spike my hair and, and we could just rap with you for about 20 minutes, right? We could, I could just share with you. I got something I want to share with you children. Right. Dearly beloved, right. you know. Instead of ranting and raving, I could just hold my hands and speak softly and, and just tell you about the love of God. You know, we could do the eight series. Uh, we could do the eight-week series on grace. 
You know, and then we'll follow that up with the eight-week series on love. And then we'll follow that up with the 16-week series on mercy. You know, and we could just go and, and hope and cherry, and we could just talk about all the great. I'm all for those subjects, right. but in, in piecemeal, not as a whole, because we need to be pro we need to be proving and rebuking, and, and, and exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. That's right. And he's saying, look, watch. You know, don't let this creep in. Don't let this pull you away from the truth and, and cause you to compromise. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. You know, endure the hardships that are going to come. <coughs> he doesn't want Timothy to be caught off guard. He's telling him, you know, this is what's going to happen. Don't let it catch you by surprise. Endure afflictions. The ministry isn't supposed to be an easy life. You know, it's not, I'm not saying it has to be, you know, dragging yourself through broken glass and nails and, and everything else but you know if you're it's it's not, not it's supposed to be this cush easy thing otherwise why is he telling you to endure inflictions i mean we, if you call uh, chapter three paul said you know you fully know my manner of doctrine and what else did he say what uh what uh, persecutions i endured i mean paul was it talks often in, in many of the epistles about all the things that he suffered for the cause of christ so it shouldn't come as a surprise to us if we're going to live and serve God that we're going to have to endure infliction, afflictions. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, look, afflict or do endure afflictions. You know, and that, that again, that can come from many different sources. Adore afflictions by others from within the church, without the church. Uh, adore afflictions from the world that, that are, is going to persecute you, you know, or, or of necessity or circumstances. You know, that he might have to work harder or put in longer hours, uh, he's going to have to be willing to endure affliction. And that is what you're signing up for if you're going to sign up for the ministry. If you're doing it right, is afflictions. Now, if you would, you know, I, I'll just read you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where it, and will just remind us of some of the things that Paul went through. In verse 2 Corinthians 4, 8, if you want to turn there, he said, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus also might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul was somebody who was very accustomed to affliction. You know, he wasn't just telling Timothy to endure affliction out of a vacuum like he he knew what he was talking about he knew that this was something that comes with the territory he was somebody that dealt with a lot of things you know what go ahead and turn over to second corinthians we're going to spend a little time there there's some other things i want us to just notice in that passage so in second corinthians 4 and we see that paul is somebody very accustomed with per affliction troubled perplexed persecuted cast down bearing about in the body the dying lord jesus Delivered unto death. You know, the guy went through a lot. But he also had the proper perspective of affliction, didn't he? He knew why it was there. He knew why he had to endure these things and what it meant. And he said in verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Verse 17, For our light affliction. At the end of the day, that's what Paul called all this. He called it light affliction. I mean, would you call that light affliction? I don't know that I, I'm ready to call that light affliction. I don't know that if that's light affliction, then I haven't even endured affliction. Right. I mean, I haven't gone through anything right. compared to what Paul's gone through. You know, got a nasty text message from a, from a family member. <laughs> you know, big deal. Right. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I know it, it's, it, I don't mean to make light of that, but come on, look, get, get a perspective here. I mean, look at it the way Paul looked at it. Look at the things he went through. And if Paul can go through all that and then step back and say, our light affliction. I mean, we should be willing to endure a little bit of hardship for the cause of Christ. And that's what he's admonishing Timothy to do, to endure afflictions. That's because, why was Paul willing to do that? Why was Paul able to just step back from all that, all of the being troubled, perplexed, persecuted, cast down, bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, why was he able to be stoned of the Jews and then just get up and continue to preach and, and serve God? Why was he willing to go on even unto bonds for Christ and spend years in jail? And why was he willing to do all of that? Because of the fact that he had the proper motive. It wasn't just that he had the proper perspective. He had the proper perspective because of the prop he had the proper motive. Look at verse 1 again there in 2 Corinthians 4. 
He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. You know why Paul was able to endure all these things? For the lost sake. For the people that are lost. He goes on in verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds which, of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel uh, of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. That was his motive, was the sake of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Why was he willing to endure inflection? For the Lord's sake, for Jesus' sake. That the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. So Paul had some motives going into it. That's why he could call it light affliction, because he understood why he was enduring it. <clears throat> goes on in verse 13. We have the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I have believed, therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us, uh, us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. Why was he not going to faint at these afflictions? Not just for Jesus' sake, not just for the law's sake, not just for the church's sake. He did all that, yes, for their sake, but to what end? To the glory of God. He was willing to go through all of that because he knew at the end of the day, God was going to be glorified. It was God, you know, if he goes out and, and endures these afflictions and preaches the gospel and people get saved, no matter what afflictions he went through, at the end of the day, God was going to receive glory. Yeah. You know, and he called it light affliction. You know, and that's what we have to keep in mind. You know, it's finally cooling off here in Tucson, right? But, you know, leading up to this last few weeks, you know, we endured some light affliction. I mean, we can't really call it affliction light of what Paul went through. But, you know, going out in the 100 degree weather, you know, going up to the Indian reservations and driving many hours, people say, oh, you're wasting your time. It sounds like a lot of work and effort for nothing. And, and you know, worldly speaking, you know, or, the, uh, or humanly speaking, people might say that's not very efficient. It's not very worth, much worth it. But, you know, when you go out and you go down some two track and some barren wasteland of the reservation that no one's ever probably going to go down again to preach the gospel and you preach the gospel to somebody or you go out into Tucson and the highways and hedges in the heat and you bear the, 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 the heat of the day and the doors slamming in your face and the unreceptiveness and you find that one person, right. that one old Indian cowboy man who, who's willing to stop and listen to the gospel like I had yesterday Amen. or that one person out here in Tucson who's willing to listen, God's glorified. Amen. You know, the angels in heaven rejoice. That's right. And we don't see it here. We don't walk away and say, feeling maybe all the time saying oh you know god is glorified today sometimes maybe we drug ourselves out there and made ourselves do it out of a sense of duty but either way god is glorified Amen. no matter what things we suffer for the law's sake and that's why paul was able to endure the afflictions that he endured and call them a light affliction because he knew at the end of the day it all added up to the glory of god and that's what he was about and that's why he told him he goes on there and he says to do the work of an evangelist. Now, what is the work of an evangelist? It's go out and evangelize. Mm -hmm. You know, if you went out soul winning today, or earlier this week or whenever, you did that. You did the work of an evangelist. Now, with that in mind, you could say that the work of an evangelist is a big job. I mean, we have a big job in front of us. Yeah. Look at the map over there. <laughs> you know, that's a big job. One million, city in, uh, one million people in this city. Not to mention the, the fact that we've been commissioned you know, as, as Christians as a whole to, re to preach the gospel to every creature, to everybody. You know, I don't care what the neighborhood's like. Like we got told today, right? Hey, you shouldn't be here. This is, a, this is the, the Catholic neighborhood. You need to go over to the white side of town where all the white people are. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, no, actually, we're commissioned to go to every creature. Yeah, right. you know, I had a guy earlier this week uh, up in Phoenix well, I don't talk about this at the door, and I really don't think it's something that should be discussed going door to door. And I said, okay, have a nice day. Walk away. No, I'm walking away. Maybe you should consider that. You know, oh, yeah, I should consider that. How about I consider the fact that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel yeah, to every creature. Right. And, you know, and, and, and it's always amazing to me, let me just go off for a minute, that people who don't are, in, are not interested, they want to sit there and tell you, they're not interested in talking at the door, but they'll tell you, they want to talk at the door why they're not interested. Yeah, right. 
I'm not interested in talking at the door and let me explain to you why. Mm -hmm. No thanks. Because I'm less interested than you are disinterested in what I'm interested in. <laughs> right? I'm less interested in your disinterest yep. than you are interested. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> but isn't that funny? Yeah. That people want to sit there and, and tell us why we shouldn't do that and then we should consider whether or not what we're doing is right. You know, we, we're going to go out and endure these things because we understand that we have to do the work of evangelists to the glory of God. It's a big job. Somebody has to do it. You know, if we don't do it, then who? Yeah, right. You know, if, if, if the role uh, uh, of the evangelist isn't fulfilled, who's going to fulfill it? If we don't go out and preach to these people, who else is going to do it? Now, I'm sure there's probably people out there that do it. There's probably a church somewhere in Tucson that has the right gospel that goes out on some level and, you know, is preaching to somebody. But is there a church in this town that wants to preach to every single person in this town that wants to knock every door? Now, are we going to have an opportunity to preach to every single person? No. We're going to knock every door and try. Some people aren't going to be home. Some people aren't going to want to hear it. Some people are going to look out their shades and close them and just ignore us. Yep. But you know what? There's going to be some people that open the door. Yep. There's going to be some people that listen. Right. And there's going to be some people that are going to get saved. So we need to do the work of an evangelist. Look at verse 6 back in 2 Timothy. We'll move on here. So if you recall, 2 Timothy consisted a lot of Paul just really ad admonishing Timothy to continue to endure, to preach, to do the work. He's really just, you get the sense that he's just really imploring him to continue on in his footsteps. And verse 6 really shows us Paul's motive behind what he's written to Timothy. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now, I believe Paul is referring to the fact that he knew his death was nigh, that he was going to be leaving this world. And that's really Paul's motive behind what he's, why he's writing these things to Timothy. Because Tim, he, Paul desired a predecessor. He wanted somebody to come in his behind, in his footsteps, and carry on the work of the ministry. And that's what he's trying to encourage Timothy to do. To, to, to be the pastor, to be the evangelist, to, to do the work of the ministry. He wanted this to continue. He desired that. And he goes on in verse 7 and he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And, you know, that's a really... If you, there's anything you want on your epitaph and your, on your tombstone, that'd be a good one right there. Yeah. Which, you know, would to God that all of his people could say that at the end of their life. Like, have that same testimony. That they have fought a good fight. You know, that they, 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 didn't, they didn't give up. They didn't quit. They didn't put down the word of God. They didn't apologize. They didn't back down from preaching what needed to be preached. Or going out and reaching the lost. They fought. They finished the course. And they kept the faith. So Paul here, he's, he's, he's showing his motive behind what he's writing. He's trying to encourage Timothy. And he's reminding him of his example. He's saying, look, you, it, like we saw earlier in the, in the previous chapter, earlier this week, you thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, long-suffering, so on and so forth. And he's reminding Timothy of his example. And really the example that we need to take from this is that it's not how you start in the Christian life. It's how you finish. What matters most in the Christian life is not how you start, it's how you finish. Because, you know, <laughs> if you're faithful into the end, you know, you might accomplish more than somebody who maybe started earlier in life. You know, maybe you're, you were older, older we're, we're, we, you know, we, we didn't grow up in the Christian home. You know, we're not starting out as a young person in the faith. We're not starting out as a young person, <clears throat> you know, from, from a young age, knocking the doors, learning to give the gospel, learning the things of God middle-aged and onwards, you know, we, we come to the Lord later in life. But you know what? If, that, if, if you have those two people that start out, you have the person who you know, had, started out very young you know, and, and was able to, to learn the things of God early on and begin to do the work of the Lord. If he quits, if that person quits, you know, that's it. Just because he ha has more opportunity doesn't mean he's going to take advantage of it. Right. But the person who comes in later you know, he could still potentially have a longer, you know, enough lifespan to even outwork that guy. It's a matter of whether or not they're both going to endure unto the end, whether right. they're going to uh, work unto the end, whether or not they're going to finish their course, right. whether or not they're going to keep the faith. Now, obviously, if the guy, and what did God it happen in every instance, the person, the young person who starts out in the Christian home could say that, as Paul did, right. then yeah, they're going to accomplish a great deal in their life. But it should show us something. I mean, Paul is a perfect example of that. Paul came to the Lord later in life. You know, and he said that he was set forth an example to them that should come after, or that should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was an example to those people. A pattern.
for, uh, for those that should believe hereafter. That you can come to the Lord later in life and still accomplish the great things for God. I mean, Paul accomplished a great deal in his life. You know, and that's why he was able to get to the end and say, hey, look, I fought a good fight. I, kept, I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And he's reminding Timothy, it's not how you start. It's how you finish in the Christian life. So the admonition tonight is to you know, determine now not to quit wherever you are in life. Young, old, middle-aged, child, whatever. Wherever you are right now, just determine that you're not going to quit. Amen. And you think, well, I'll never quit. You'd be surprised people that quit. And you'd be surprised that how many people quit. People quit on all the time because, like I said, it's affliction. It's persecution. It's, it's not always easy to, to, to live the Christian life. And people quit all the time. And often, you know, they do it under spiritual circumstances. Some, something happens in the church. There's some kind of drama. And they just want to pin the reason why they quit on somebody else. Well, I don't like how the pastor handled that situation, so I'm out of here. And they're quitting on God. Yeah. But it's spiritual because, you know, they don't like this or that about the church. Or so-and-so offended me and, and, you know, whatever, I quit. You know, and I can look back at my Christian life and say there were opportunities where I could have done the same thing. Where I could have said, well, you know, I just don't, it's obvious just God isn't, whatever. You know, made some stupid spiritual excuse and bowed out of the Christian life. And gone back to the world and, and, and forgot about God. But uh, thank God, you know, through His mercy and grace, I didn't do that. And uh, I want to, you know, but here, same thing. You know, I have to determine that same thing every day I get up. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. And if you, don't, if you don't allow your faith to, to, to rest in men but in the Lord, you won't quit. You know, if you're following God, if you're following the Bible, if you want to be faithful to Him, like Paul, if you want to do all things to the glory of God, you're not going to quit. Because it does, it won't matter what man does, and you know, you know. Uh, spoiler alert: man's going to disappoint you. Right. Every man is going to fail you in some way, right. or not be what you expect them to be, or let you down somehow, or hurt you. Every because they're flesh, just like you. So don't let your faith rest in men. Let it rest in God. And you know what? Then you'll probably be able to say, in all likelihood, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I didn't quit. Because again, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Look there at verse 8. Because, you know, we don't just keep the faith and we don't just continue on just for the sake of being able to say we did. You know, we want to be able to have that testimony. But there's a reward for that. There's a reward for that. Look in verse 8. He said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. There is a reward for those that keep the faith, that don't quit. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. You want to talk about being honored by somebody? I mean, the, it's the Lord that's going to give him that at that, at that day. I believe the Lord is actually going to put that on his head. That we'll see that. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that, but does that, he said, look, the, uh, he shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all, all those that love his appearing. Yep. That God is going to honor us. You know, and, and people today, they seek honor from men. They want, they want that, their moment in the sun, right? They go to great lengths to be able to stand on some pedestal and have someone put a you know, little gold nugget around their neck and sing their national anthem and hope maybe even end up on a Wheaties box you know, at the Olympics and things like that. And that's not the worst thing in the world to desire, I guess, but hey, if that's your desire, if you want to have some honor, here's one. Uh, that's a, top that. You know, you can take your, your gold medal and throw it in the lake. Yeah, I'll take that crown of righteousness, you know, and, and, I'll, and I'll sing praises to God for it. You can keep your national anthem. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a reward that's laid up for. That's the motive of why we don't quit. That's, that's what should keep us in the faith. That's what keep us in the fight. The fact that there is a reward for those that will endure. So Paul's motivation is his reward. Thank you. Uh, you know, and he says there, look at the end, he says, we say, well, that's Paul, right? Well, that's Paul. Paul was something different. Well, he says, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. All them that love his appearing. So that same reward that Paul has is available to me and you. Imagine having, being able to have the same reward as Paul the Apostle. But that's exactly what he's saying. You say it's impossible. No, that's what he's saying. It's available to all them that love his appearing. You know, if you have, if you love his appearing, you can have that reward. You'll say, how do I know if I love his appearing? Well, you know, it'll probably show up in your life. 
you know, and, and we won't have to look very hard. If you love the appearing, the thought of the Lord Jesus Christ coming and receiving you unto himself, if that's what you look for, that's what you desire in your life, it's going to reflect it in the way you live your life. He goes on there and he says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me. So does that sound like a guy who is desiring the, 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 the crown of righteousness to receive that reward that's available to all of us, this Demas? No, because he's forsaken him. He quit. He did not keep the faith, right? And what did he do? He, he for, forsaken him, having loved this present world. You see, if we're loving the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not going to love the present world. We're not going to get caught up in all the things that the world wants to distract us with. We're going to remain focused. We're going to be doing the work. We're going to be out there serving the Lord. And it's going to reflect in our life. And, and we're, we're going to be able to see whether or not we really love His appearing, whether or not we're really looking and hasting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if not, you know, you end up like a Demas. You know, Demas is someone who didn't, uh, had the proper motive, didn't have the proper uh, uh, motivation. He, did, you know, he didn't have the proper perspective, and he ends up falling out of the ministry. You know, and I believe Demas was a saved guy. I believe he was. I believe he, but he's just somebody that you know got tired of the things of God, got tired of the fight, got tired of the afflictions, saw how easy the world has it, and you know what? It's true. The world doesn't have it as hard sometimes in this life. You know, they, they're not, they're out on the lake on Sunday, casting a line and, and enjoying life. And, you know, they're not worried about getting in church. And they're, they're letting the world raise their kids. They're not the ones trying to get in there and have them do that hard work. And there's, a, you know, you, a per, even a Christian could say, boy, I'd rather have that. I'd rather have that easier life. And I, I mentioned this Thursday. People that quit on God, often what you hear come out of their mouth, it's like a weight's been lifted. And you know why I say that? I know I already said this, but I'll remind us again. It's because a weight has been lifted. Because the Christian life is pressure. Yeah. Because there is a burden to bear in the Christian life. And if, if you're going to get into it, you have to come into it understanding that and saying, being prepared. And that's what Paul's writing Timothy and warning him about. Saying, look, endure affliction. He's not sugarcoating it. And, you know, we as preachers shouldn't sugarcoat it either. It's going to be work. And, <laughs> you know, Demas is an example of somebody that you don't want to be like. And Demas was one who loved the present world. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, when it says the love of the Father is not in him, it doesn't, it's not saying that God doesn't love that guy. That's not what it's saying. It's saying his love of the Father is not in him. And Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You will love one or hate the other. You will hold the one... And, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and men. You cannot drink at the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Right. You, can't, you, you can't do both. You're going to do one or the other. And so if you love the world, then you're not going to love God. You're going to love the world. And you're going to end up like a Demas who forsakes the ministry, forsakes the man of God. So he says the love of the Father is not in him. And, you know, if you love God, and if you're the type of person who is going to... Uh, and finish your course who's going to keep the faith, you know, it's going to show up in your life. And part of that is you're going to love God. And if you love God, you're also going to love the brethren. You know, that, those things go hand in glove. Loving God and loving the brethren are two things that go together. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, I'll just read you for sake of time. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So one way to know they have the love of God is if we love the brethren. You know, and if you love the brethren, you'll be in church. <laughs> you know? I don't know how else to say it. You know, you'll love being here. And it won't just be like, oh, I'm going to drag myself into church again. I look forward to coming down to church. I look forward to seeing everybody in this room. I love the people here. I love spending time with, with y'all and, and preaching and going out. And I especially love going over to Sonoran Delights and getting in my spotos. And man, it's been two weeks since I've been over there and I got a hankering. So, but you know, I love the brethren. And if I could, I could go over and get a respato anytime I want. But you know what? I'd love it even more when I have the brethren with me. And I love it even more after it's been a hard day of soul winning, hard afternoon of soul winning with the brethren. Man, it makes it even sweeter. 
So if we love God, you know, if we love the brethren, we're going to continue and we're going to remain steadfast unto the end. <clears throat> so Paul here, kind of at the end, it's kind of unfortunate. I mean, <clears throat> and he starts to give out this list of names, right? And, and, and it's kind of, uh, there's some things to learn about it. We'll wrap it up here, but you know, he starts out by mentioning this guy Demas and saying, oh yeah, by the way, Demas hath forsaken me. And I believe Demas is someone you're going to see in heaven. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be awkward <laughs> meeting Demas. I'm going to put that off for a few millennium. <laughs> hey, I'm Corbin. What's your name? Demas? Demas? Yes, yeah, that Demas. <laughs> you're the one who forsook Paul. You know? And, and you know, maybe somebody can make the argument that he wasn't saved. I personally think he was because it mentions him elsewhere in, in, a, in a more positive light. But it just goes to show you that could be any one of us. I mean, how would you like to have that written down? But you know what? You'd say, no, no, not us, but there's a lot of Christians. God could write the same thing down about them. Yeah. So-and-so hath forsaken me. So-and-so hath quit on the, on the brethren. So-and-so hath, you know, uh, left the church. So-and-so has gone back to the world and is living in sin. God could write that about a, a whole score of, of people. And unfortunately, Demas gets, you know, for his, unfortunately for him, fortunately for us, we get to see that there is an example of that. And unfortunately, he has to, that's his reputation for eternity. You know, we don't want that to be ours. You know, we want the reputation of Paul. Amen. Of, I've, I've kept the faith. Yeah, amen. You know, I finished my course. I didn't forsake. I didn't go back to the world. So, <clears throat> he goes on and he says, uh, Demoth hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans unto Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Now, these other two guys, I don't believe they were backslidden. I don't think they were forsaking him. Because he doesn't say that about them. He's just, saying, he's just making them boy, hey, I'm, I'm alone. Every, I'm, I, this is where I'm at, uh, Timothy. I'm alone now. You know, I had Demas, but he took off because he loved the present world. Cretans went to Galatia probably to serve, you know, probably to continue the work because that's what Titus did. We know Titus is also, that's the next epistle, uh, to the, you know, a pastoral epistle is to Titus. So we know that he is one that continued in the faith and he went to D D uh, Dalmatia. Dalmatia. And he goes on, in verse 11 and said only Luke is with me take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry now I can't read that verse without mentioning this uh, about Mark go ahead and turn back to Acts chapter 15 so Mark so you have an example of a Demas who's somebody who forsakes the man of God you know started and again it goes back to this theme of it's not how you start it's how you finish Demas starts out good right but then he ends up with a quitting on God, quitting on the man of God, getting out of ministry, going back to the world. He doesn't finish the course. He doesn't keep the faith. And then you have the example of Mark as somebody who started out poorly and ended well. So in Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, verse 35, we'll see where, where we first meet Mark here. It says, Paul and Barnabas, all, uh, all, Paul also and Barnabas continued to Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, uh, with many others also. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. This is that same Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed uh, from them, uh, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. So they're setting back out to go back out and visit the churches from their first journey. And uh, Barnum's saying, well, hey, let's take John Mark. And Paul's saying, no. He quit on us in Pamphylia. He didn't go to the work. He doesn't want to bring him along. And, you know, he's not, he's not profitable in ministry. And look how it goes on and says, and the con verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. You know, Barnabas and Paul, I have to believe at this point, were probably very close friends. They were probably, I mean, they spent a lot of time together. They'd suffered a lot of things together. They'd gone through a lot in the, in the work of the Lord together. And you can't go through those type of things that they went through without being more closely knit to an individual like that. I mean, they just, they just, that's just the way it works. But this contention about Mark is so sharp that it just splits up guys who are probably, in all likelihood, maybe even best friends. You know, no doubt, close, dear friends. <clears throat> that's how sharp it was. And that's what, and you know, Mark probably found out about that. Well, why isn't Paul coming? Why, you know what, you know, why aren't you guys going together? And Barnabas might have had to break it to him at some point and say, hey, well, you know, it's because of you. You know? <laughs> Imagine being Mark. Man, 
and having to live that down. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, remember when we were in Pamphylia and you got a little lazy and decided not to go with us to the work and you started slacking and being a bum? Paul didn't like that. And you know, hey, it's no big deal. You can come with me, but Paul's going to go his own way. I mean, I have to imagine that bothered Mark. Yeah. I mean, it would bother me, yeah, you know, anyone who's sincere in serving Christ to find out that you've offended a man of God like that to the point where he can't even go with his friend. They're, you know, they've had such a dispute that it's broken up a friendship over my actions. I mean, that would bother me. So I have to imagine it bothered Mark, and I think it did because of the fact that we see in 2 Timothy that Mark actually, Paul calls him profitable to ministry. He redeems himself, right? That's what he said. He said, take Mark and bring him with thee because I got a bone to pick with him, right? Because this, I got, I'm going to settle the score with that guy before I depart, right? No, because he says, for he is profitable for me to the ministry. So you have an example of somebody who started out poor, but ended up finishing strong. And it goes back to that theme of it's not how you start, it's how you finish. It's keeping the faith, not starting out in the faith and then forsaking it like a demon. It's keeping it all the way into the end. I mean, Mark starts out with this bad reputation. He's a source of contention, but he improves to the point where Paul considers him profitable. So, you know, of course, as I just said, it's, it's that theme of how you start, not how, or how you finish, not how you start. But it's also a lesson to us to not write people off. Not to just write people off because they fail in some area or, or, or don't measure up. We shouldn't just write them off in the ministry. You know, because we should hope that they get it right, like a mark. That they, you know, they come around in that area and get things right because they could still be used by God. You know, somebody gets kicked out of church over some sin, you know, we should desire that they come back and get things right. You know, and, 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 and faithful work catches a lot of flack for that. Pastor Anderson catches a lot of flack for kicking people out of church, even though it's perfectly biblical, according to 1 Corinthians 5, to, to kick people out of church over certain sins. It's, it's, in fact, the Bible demands it. And people say, I can't believe you kick out people out of church. But they never hear about all the people, that, those same people that come back. Does it happen every time? No. But people come back and they get right with God. You know, and, and why don't you hear about him? Because you don't, you don't bring it up again. His sin shall not be mentioned unto him. You know, if, if the wicked gets right and, and does right, his sins shall not be mentioned again unto him. You know, we let them live that down and move on. That's what Paul did with Mark. He let him live it down and said, you know what? He's profitable to me. Bring him with, bring him with you. So we need to let people, don't write them off. You know, if, even if they mess up, if they make a mistake, doesn't mean they're down and out. They should be encouraged. You know, we should exhort them as brethren. You know, we, we should want them to get things right. So then in verse 12, go back there, we'll wrap it up here. He kind of goes through this, just this, this, this kind of salutation where he starts listing these names. And he says, And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas and Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, especially the parchments. So he's asking for a cloak. And it's kind of, Strange, why would you ask for a garment? Well, we have to remember that, you know, he couldn't just go down to, you know, uh, what's some clothing store? You know, Goodwill wasn't on every corner. You know, there wasn't a Ross dress for less, you know, in every, in every square mile for him to just go get clothes. Clothes were a commodity back then that were very difficult and expensive to come by in many cases to get good clothing. So it might be, this kind of tells us about the state that Paul's in in his life. You know, he's ready to be offered you know, he's in jail. You know, he might be sitting in a prison cell. Maybe they're not clothing him correctly or, you know, whatever it might be. But he's looking for this cloak for some reason or another. I tend to think that's probably why. And he goes, uh, uh, and he also says, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. And I believe that's a reference to the, the, the manuscripts of the Old Testament that he had, yep. that he wanted the word of God, even unto the end, you know. And that should tell us that we never outgrow the word of God. Even when you, you're like a man like Paul where you're getting to the very end of your life and you're ready to depart and you could say things like, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. He still desires the Word of God. And not just out of a sense of duty. We should grow to the place where, yeah, we read our Bibles, we're in the Word of God because we're supposed to be. But it should come to a place in our Christian life where we want to be in the book. We want to read the Bible. You know, if we're struggling with reading the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to read the Bible? Or because if we really want to read the Bible, it won't be such a chore to read it. You know, can we say that we delight in His law? It is my meditation all the day. And I believe that's what we see here with Paul. That even at the end of his life, a man who was thoroughly acquainted with the Scriptures, 
is still desiring to have them, even in his last, last moments. So he goes on and he gives, of course, this, this list of people. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. <gasps> Paul, how could you name the names? You know, but this is a perfect example of somebody getting up and naming the names. You know, and, and you, know, you say, well, you shouldn't declare him publicly. Well, how about, well, how, how, can, how, can it, how can it be wrong to declare, call people out publicly when it's appropriate when Paul's having it penned down in the eternal pages of Scripture? Yeah. You know, I don't think Alexander the coppersmith's going to be there. But, uh, you know, if he were, he'd be another one of those guys that had that reputation. But notice what he says about him. He says, the Lord reward him. You know, and that's a good reminder to us that we don't have to avenge ourselves. You know, that as, as the Bible says, if vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know, we go about, we do the work, and we don't have to defend ourselves. We don't have to right every wrong. We don't have to contend with every fool that's out there. You know, the Lord reward you. You know, we don't have to sit there and, and defend ourselves in every corner, you know. Um, and I'm trying not to go off about last week again. <laughs> that fool out soul winning, you know. But that's a perfect example, you know. Somebody just wants to be contentious and cantankerous and just do you evil, do you much evil, slow down the, or hinder the work of God in some way. Well, you know what? The Lord reward you. You know, the Lord reward you according to your works, what you've done. He says, Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray that it may not be laid to their charge. I mean, look at, I mean, that's the kind of heart Paul had for people. He, you know, the same heart that Jesus had. Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, he's more interested in people being saved than in himself being vindicated. He wants people to come around and see the truth more than him to just be proven right. So that's the kind of attitude that we should desire to have as well. And he said uh, in verse, um, verse 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. So again, though no man stood with him, the Lord stood with him. You know, that should be encouragement to us if we ever find ourselves in that situation where we feel like we're all alone. You know, the Lord is still there. And strengthen me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So we see here again, God's desire is that the preaching may be fully known and that all the Gentiles might be here. That's the vision that God has. And that's the vision that we need to have as Christians at a church. Now, of course, we can't reach all the Gentiles, but we can reach quite a few of them in our lifetimes. If every one of us determines to do that, we can get a lot done. And it takes a collective group of people to accomplish reaching the whole world, right? That, uh, making sure that all the Gentiles have heard. And he goes on in verse 18 and says, uh, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will pursue, uh, preserve me unto his earthly kingdom to whom be glory and honor forever and ever. And then he kind of ends here with these salutations. He says, Salute Pris uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and that's you know, Priscilla and Aquila, and, uh, and the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus abode at Corinth, Tro uh, Tro Trophimus have I let, uh, left at Miletum sick, do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus, greet thee, uh, and Prudence, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. So it's kind of interesting, this list, and I think there's just one last thing I want to point out here before we close tonight. Is when you look at this last list, you know, there's some negative mentions, right? There's Demas, there's Alexander the coppersmith, there's the fact that, you know, no man stood with me, all men forsook me. There's a lot of negative, isn't there? But at the end, you know, he gives this list where he says, salute Priscilla, Aquila, the household of Onesiphorus. I mean, who knows how many people that makes up right there. Erastus, a, a, a boat at Corinth. But tro, uh, tro, uh, Trophimus have I left at my lead him sick. So there's another one. You know, he's not saying anything bad about him. He's just giving an update on him. Do thy diligence to come before win winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. And what this tells us is that, you know, in the Christian life, you know, we're probably going to encounter enemies. We're going to have people that are, are going to be considered enemies. They're going to do us evil, and they're going to withstand our words, and they're going to, you know, and all of that. But at the end of the day, in the ministry, in the Christian life, you have more friends than enemies. That's what I see when I read this. You see some negative guys, but then there's just this list of people at the end that are just, you know, greet so-and-so, the whole household of so-and-so, all these people, you know, uh, that are just friends. At the end of the, life, end of the day, the Christian life, you make more friends than enemies. And, you know, that's what Jesus said, you know, uh, Whosoever forsaken wife or father or mother shall in this life have ten times more. Shall have brothers and sisters and, and households. 
it, you know, we have more, we make more friends in the ministry than we make enemies. And you know, we should keep that in mind, you know, should this body, this church ever go through a time of public persecution, or maybe even the city of Tucson, the, the individuals, large groups of people would protest. You know, we think about other churches that have gone through that. That could happen here. You know, if I keep ripping on these faggots long enough, right. eventually they're going to get mad. Yeah. You know, and, and they're going to take their stupid pride parade from downtown and come over here and, and have a march. Right. And I say, come on down, because there's no such thing as bad press. Right. You know, you're more than welcome to, to stand over there. You know, you're not allowed in here. But, but you know, and, and that could seem overwhelming. You know, when you, when you go to a church like wh what I went to Verity when they were being protested, you have hundreds of, of an angry mob standing outside the church protesting some, uh, something a preacher had said that was biblical and right and true. Yeah, right. You know, you could get the feeling that maybe there's more people against us than for us. But what you won't see is all the people spread out all across this country that believe like you, that are praying for you. And the fact is, at the end of the day, you make more friends than enemies in the ministry. I, I, I really believe that. And, uh, and that's the example of Paul. Now, you know, again, 2 Timothy, a great book. Very encouraging book. A, a, a book where we really see the heart of Paul that he had for the ministry and his desire to see Timothy follow after him and follow in his footsteps to continue in the work. And really, it's an admonition to us to do the same. That we would continue to do the work of an evangelist. That we would continue to endure inflictions. And to, and to continue on in the work of God. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and pray.